I should have been so offended that I said, oh, well, I won't come. But uh, I will use my time uh, to take you through, first of all, very big X, which is inspired by Mary Lou's presentation yesterday, which is the next slide. Um, that's the really big X, and it's the opposite. Uh, this is from the year uh, 1910. It was a postcard made in France, and the artist was uh, showing the fact that you, their image in 2000 would be wearing something, and it's got to be possible to put on a helmet and put a book into your head without you having to read it. And if that's true, that would change the world in many ways. Uh, I hope people are working on it. I'm not. I'm going to show you a much more modest X, uh, and, but I'd love to see that happen. Um, my X is, is basically something I've been doing for a long time. I'm going to talk very little, a bit, very little about one laptop per child, but much more about the general problem and then a very specific uh, experiment. I think primary education is the world's biggest problem. Now, yes, there are others, energies, but primary education uh, is important not just because there are 1.5 billion children and 100 million of them don't go to first grade, but primary education is different than middle school, high school, and university. It's not what you learn. It's not the subjects and the facts you learn. What you have to learn in primary education is learning itself. And then as a th sub theme, which is perhaps maybe a super theme, is you've got to become passionate about it. So learning to learn and learning to love to learn is, is really important. And what do you do when you have 100 million uh, who don't go to school? Then the solution is, can't, what can they learn by themselves? And the reason I look at that, and I think it's, uh, it, it is a moonshot, is because you don't have to learn everything by yourself. And if you do go to school, it still applies to you. But for those 100 million, that's all you have. There won't be teachers for a while. Uh, there are no literate people in the village. And the kids aren't going, aren't not going to school because they're working in the fields. There just isn't one. So that's what we, we're, we're looking at. Uh, the laptop, just by way of background, uh, has about 2.5 million in the field. Over the past five years, we've spent, believe it or not, $1 billion. So it's a huge project. Um, and there's a lot of results from it. Uh, in uh, Peru, this actually happens to be Peru, um, kids are teaching their parents to read and write. Uh, we don't know the exact numbers, but it could be as high as 50%, which would mean that 500,000 kids, 6 to 12 years old, are teaching their parents how to read and write. I don't have a better story. That's as good as it gets. Um, and it's very, very different. This, I always put this slide up. It's one of my favorite. This man in, this, in India had never, ever seen a computer. He had always taught with the kids in straight lines. They were standing there petrified to answer uh, because or sitting on these little mats because they didn't want to be wrong. And this is how he teaches today. So this is a slide who just sent to me from uh, one of our teams that went into Ethiopia recently. And I just put a caption at the bottom in case you can't read the handwriting. Um, and I thought that was quite uh, extraordinary that the people of this village uh, were smart enough to realize that education is cheaper than ignorance. Um, here's what learning by yourself for us needs. And so we are framing this in terms of technologies. I have four of them that I think are important. Uh, the fourth is perhaps the most important. The $10 tablet, uh, Herman Hauser has shown you some of his stuff. Uh, I have some printed electronics. We saw some yesterday for com conformable machines. A $10 tablet is really doable. And if somebody wanted to do the moonshot for the $10 tablet and do one tablet per child, and I'll pass around actually for those of you who want to entertain yourself playing with things while I talk. Um, one is a model. I'll send it this way. And one's actually a working machine. These are the, so you don't count your family. So we'll pass. <laughs> and you can pass the cover separately. Um, 
And I just pass that around because we're doing now, and and is is it's gotten a lot of press. But what does it need? What are the four things you need to do? Um, printed, I've mentioned. Mary Lou's made a fantastic dual mode display that is really high contrast when it reflects and low power when it transmits. The fact that this doesn't exist is inexcusable. Not because Mary Lou hasn't had it, but the world really needs it. Your, your iPad should be a Kindle when you want it to be, and your Kindle should be an iPad when you want it to be, at least in terms of the display. 10 meter drop tests we do easily now, and waterproof is also the one being passed around is waterproof. You can drop it in the water and use it underwater. Um, I really feel strongly about connectivity and trying to find ways to create, and I deliberated between using the term no cost and almost no cost, and uh, no cost can be done by coming up with some standby concepts where bits don't get transmitted, get cached, and only used when the system uh, isn't being used because bandwidth is the most perishable commodity on the planet. You don't use it right now, it's gone. So if it's there, use it, and nobody else is using it. Uh, it there are concepts of no cost and standby that, that are pretty, pretty simple. Uh, yesterday's spray-on antenna, boy, would I like to make a phased array. So kids, kids walking around with things together make a satellite antenna. It's perfectly possible. Um, also, I imagine going with the spray can and spraying periodically, making more or less an infinite mesh network that just went around the world, uh, and kids would be just sent spray cans, and you'd create the world's network, and trickle charging is pretty important. Power, we are so, we are so committed to power. The machine that's circulating uh, is three watts. The machine we're, that's coming off the assembly line is one watt. Uh, your laptop is, Mary Lou, help me, 35 to 40? Our laptops? What are laptops today, roughly? Uh, about 15 watts. No, no, but a, a general laptop. Isn't it more like 30 watts, 35 watts? Yeah. But it's, it's, so one watt is important to us because we want the kids to wind it. We want to use your upper body to power these things. And then there's a lots, again, things you could, I've always been puzzled that when my cell phone runs out of power, why can't I just shake it a little bit and then continue the call? Say, one moment, please. Okay, what were we saying? It's doable, and people just don't do it. Now, here's the hard part. The hard part is that the constructionists, of which I'm one, um, we've done a very bad job over the past 25 years. It has it, it, a lot of good papers, a lot of good speeches, but what I'll call instructionism, which is sort of 3A, has, has sort of crept forward. And more and more people think that what we have to do, and this is obviously much more for older kids, is we've got to get things in their head and then test whether it's in their head or not. And we're going to give them a body of knowledge and then test whether they know it. Well, in our world, especially for younger kids, that isn't important. And I know I keep repeating it, but what's important is have you learned what is sometimes called critical thinking, creative thinking, and writing computer programs has sort of fallen off the table. Some of you, well, most people in this room do it, but I'm talking about kids who are today 20 to 25 years old who went to the best schools in this country, private schools, didn't write computer programs. And 25 years ago, we thought they all would. When Seymour Papert did Logo back in the 70s, the idea was that when a kid wrote a program, that was the closest that child would come to thinking about thinking. And then when the child debugged the program, which definitely has to happen, it never works on the first time, that the act of debugging was a close approximation of learning about learning. And we saw in New York City, 1975, the kids who were writing logo programs were better spellers. Huh? Unrelated. Why would you be a better speller? You know why you're a better speller? Because when they were getting their spelling tests, guess what? The programmers were interested in the bugs. 
They were interested in which words they got wrong. They discussed them. They trade them. They said, is it I before E except after C? When I went to school, if I got two out of ten words wrong, I was thrilled it was a B. I was such a bad speller, I never got a B. So I took the two that I did and I hid them. And I just couldn't have cared less. So simply celebrating the bugs is a fundamental piece of learning. And you learn that again. So it's not whether I have learned my multiplication tables till 25. It's not whether I have looked at Khan Academy videos for six hours and picked up some body of knowledge. And it's not even as if I've read lots of books. Most Americans don't know the difference between the Baltics and the Balkans. And we're not going to sit here and say, well, you've got to know the difference between the Baltics and the Balkans. There are, you've got to know how to find out the difference. And for these kids, the most important thing, this is where I'm going to end, is learning to read. So what are we doing today? We're doing a very small experiment. It's funded out of my pocket. That's how small it is. Um, and this experiment is the following question. Can a child learn how to read on his or her own? The brain has evolved over roughly a million years or more, and it knows how to walk and talk. It is you're wired to do those. I can take a five-year-old child from any country, Nepal, Africa, nation, blah, 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 drop that child in Paris, and within 10 months, five-year-old child will be speaking French. No question. Reading doesn't work that way. The brain does not read naturally. It's only 3,500 years old. We haven't evolved a reading brain. But from that comment, you don't leap to say, oh, yes, and reading requires three years of painful sitting in a classroom and doing calligraphy and phonetics and being yelled at for three years. No. There's something probably a lot simpler. So what we've done, and this is the first village we're working in, is we're going into villages that have no literacy, zero. No literate adult within 200 miles. We've picked two. This is one of them. They went in last week. They, in this case, are 30 tablets with tons and tons of books that read themselves. Tom Khalil said he wanted that. Well, we have thousands of books that read themselves, children's books, cartoons with, with titles, games with phonetics and letters and so on, and all sorts of stuff. And basically the question is, six months later, eight months later, go back, do the kids read? If the answer is yes, that is so transformational. Now the first time we go in, we want to see and sort of what we're trying to learn what we should put really on the tablet. So the tablets that are in the field today, as I speak, in that particular village with those kids and their friends, are probably a far shot from what should be. But when we can find out stuff that is, then within some short period, it's going to be done very rigorously. OLPC has been criticized for not being scientific enough. Boy, this time we're doing the opposite. We're working with our critics. We're doing it as a real experiment. And I hope to be able to report in some, whether it's two years or one year, doesn't matter. But if we can prove that children can learn how to read on their own, that's going to help the 100 million kids who don't go to school. So that's my mini moonshot in the other moonshot, absent the helmet we wear to download all the books on the planet into our head. Thank you very much. Let us define X. X is a solution, a solution to a seemingly insurmountable problem, like climate change or cancer, one that affects the world. But what if we redefine X as a challenge, an opportunity for radical thinking, a chance to light up the world with breakthrough ideas and cutting edge technology, the stuff of science fiction that just might fly after all. Solving for X requires wonder and imagination and the vision to build seemingly impossible solutions to the world's biggest problems. Solve for X. Moonshot thinking.